Well, um, we have a couple of questions that were posted, and uh, and I will start with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Taliban's takeover in 2021 and the war in Ukraine in 2022 have added to, rec to, to a record displacement worldwide. As a global leader, speak to what the United States should and can do to address. Okay, should I jump right in? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, first of all, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you for hosting us here today. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with that one. Um, so as Batar has just said, uh, we did indeed hit a, a grim global milestone this year with over 100 million people displaced globally. Um, especially in the last year, there's just been tremendous um, destruction and loss of, of life and, and community and safety and homes. And so we are deeply, um, we're deeply aware of the challenges ahead and we are uh, working as a, a global leader in humanitarian response. The US government is working to respond to these conflicts, alleviate human suffering and find durable solutions to displacement. So my bureau, the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration sits within the State Department, which is our foreign policy arm within the US government. We also work closely with our partners at the US agent, uh, USAID, US Agency for International Development, the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs collectively to address these uh, challenges. So I'll speak a little bit about how we do that, both internationally and then domestically, uh, with probably a little bit more detail on the domestic front, which is the area I know best because I oversee our resettlement work. But globally, the US government responds to these crises first and foremost by being the largest single uh, provider of humanitarian assistance worldwide. And in the last year alone, we provided $17 billion in humanitarian response across the US government. That money goes to um, urgent protection needs, it goes to things like shelter and water and sanitation, psychosocial support, legal assistance, um, educational and, and gender-based violence prevention response, I've already said that. Um, so those are the kinds of activities that we do and we do it in partnership with the, um, primarily with international organizations like the UN High, Com High Commissioner for Refugees and international NGOs. So that's what we do in terms of our first response. We also, within the State Department, um, we are engaged in very uh, sustained and vigorous humanitarian diplomacy with refugee hosting countries, other donor countries, uh, multilateral uh, platforms, international organizations and NGOs to work to find durable solutions to displacement. And those generally tend to be in three categories. The first is safe and voluntary return home when conditions permit. Um, secondly, um, local integration into countries of asylum where that's possible. And then finally, third, um, permanent resettlement in third countries um, such as the United States. So that's what I'll speak a little bit more about here. Um, and I should apologize, I'm uh, also uh, feeling the elevation here. So I'm, I'm a little dehydrated. I might have to pause every now and then for some water. But um, in terms of resettlement, it is really, um, the most visible manifestation of a foreign, of a, of a values-based foreign policy. And we feel that right up into the, the top of the State Department leadership. Secretary uh, Blinken last year told Congress that a robust refugee admissions program is an important, enduring, and ongoing expression of our commitment to international humanitarian principles and our tradition as a nation that has long welcomed immigrants and refugees. So we, um, we enact this commitment through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, which we also call U.S. RAP, and that's how we bring refugees who are fleeing violence and persecution overseas to communities across the United States. And each year we, we welcome tens of thousands, which we aspire to, to reach many more this year. Um, I wanted to speak really quickly to your, your specific questions about uh, U Ukraine and Afghanistan. Um, alongside the robust humanitarian support that we're providing to, to partners in, in and around those countries, we are also working to bring as many people to safety as possible. So with regard to Ukraine, historically the way that we have welcomed Ukrainians is through something that we call the Lautenberg Program. It's a program that um, enables religious minorities from the former Soviet Union to be reunited with, with their family based in the United States. And we've welcomed 14,000 individuals um, since 2018 through that program. But of course, given the crisis in Ukraine with, with Russia's invasion and the need for really um, immediate but temporary protection, we created last year a new program, which I think many of you might be familiar with, called U Uniting for Ukraine, which enables 
Ukrainian citizens to come via a parole pathway and a US-based sponsor to agree to support them for two years during their um, parole period. Um, so that program has been just an amazing um, success so far. The, the numbers have really um, overwhelmed us as well. I'm gonna tell you some of the numbers if I can get them. Um, since the launch of You4U, you, we've, been, we've um, received nearly 195,000 sponsorship applications and approved more than 138,000 individuals for travel. Just by comparison, last year, uh, we welcomed only 11,000 through our our traditional resettlement program. So this has really, um, really um, opened just enormous possibility for us to provide immediate protection. But before the war in Ukraine, of course, we faced a crisis in Afghanistan. And there, uh, with, the, with the fall of Kabul, we had to really quickly work to evacuate our allies. We, we welcomed over 100,000 individuals in a very short amount of time, 83,000 of whom we resettled with the help of our resettlement partners across the country. Um, so that was also a really significant development last year, and one that enabled us to try um, new approaches to, to welcoming refugees, and in particular, we were really excited in that moment um, to, to experiment with ways to better support refugees. And we stood up a new program called uh, the Sponsor Circle Program for Afghans that enabled private individuals to, to directly welcome Afghans who were arriving and coming through our safe haven bases across the country. And through that program, the first time we'd ever done anything like that. We had um, over 1,000 sponsors across 33 states welcoming over 600 Afghans. So we were really excited to, to try that new, um, that new program, and it, it really um, it reaffirmed for us the thinking that we'd been doing around a new program that I'll be talking about later today called the Welcome Corps. So maybe I'll just stop there, um, and I know that others might have more to say about that, but we can also, I'm happy to answer any questions as we engage in the conversation. Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you see your mic's working? Uh, yes. Okay. Question mark? So, no. each of you have had extensive experience working with uh, migration and refugee policies. What are the, some of the most significant changes and possibly challenges you have seen in refugee resettlement related to the changes in the administrations? <laughs> Whoever want to jump in on that? I'm happy to start that, but Skinder, I'd love, I'd love for you to jump in on this with me. Um, well, I think many are really well aware that the last 10 years or so in our recent history, um, that the conversation about newcomers has come straight to the forefront. Um, and uh, we actually ha were just talking in a sidebar about you know, um, our long, long, long history as a country of welcoming refugees actually has not come into um, such a touchy limelight until the last until the last 10 years or so. So those of you who have been working in this space for p potentially more than a decade or decades know that this is true. We used to actually not fight as a country about resettling refugees. And so this is a new thing, especially if you're uh, relatively new to this space. I want to let you know this is a new thing and we've been in a better place before and hopefully we're charting back to that place. But it is really true that um, we have a very active conversation happening in our country right now about um, how many newcomers are welcomed, why they're welcomed and who's welcomed. Um, specifically focused on the, the refugee conversation, the last you know, uh, two and a half <laughs> administrations, um, we've seen this sort of, um, this pendulum swing of difference of opinion, right? And needing to uh, respond to different types of global pressures. Um, but what I would say about that, that has been, um, that has allowed for the refugee process and all of our immigration processes, honestly, to sort of be this hockey puck um, kicked back and forth, unfortunately. However, we have been in a place before where we've been very much on the same page, and I really think um, we can get back to that place. And some of the programs that Sarah spoke about can and should be utilized to get us there, and I'll talk about that later today, but um, to uh, both tell the story of the person welcomed as well as the welcomer, I think it would be very powerful right now um, in our national dialogue to get us there. So we've certainly seen, and I'll, I'm saving the actual um, process stuff for a skinder, but we've certainly seen quite a change in the rhetoric and the messaging 
um, and the conversation at large, uh, but I am hopeful because I think this new opportunity that we've had to welcome Afghan and Ukrainian newcomers in these moments and now the parole process of uh, welcoming others is allowing us to weave this refugee conversation through a more helpful dialogue um, and with a lot more of a proximity example, if you will. Um, but process-wise, Iskinder, second part of that question, can I kick it to him about okay. where you've seen the movement? Uh, be before I do that, since Sarah mentioned the Ukrainian uh, and the Afghan uh, who came into this country, uh, I think some of you know this, within a short period of time uh, with the leadership of Sarah and the department, we managed to process and resettle, I believe, uh, a historic uh, number uh, who came to this country from August to February 15, almost 80,000 Afghans. Uh, and of course, you know, Ukrainian uh, number. And, and for some of you who are new to the refugee resettlement uh, space, we have actually resettled Afghan going back to 1980 when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the largest refugee number who went to Iran and then uh, Pakistan. So the refugee program of Afghans in this country is, is not a new thing. It just happened that uh, you know, because of the, uh, the engagement, the military engagement in Afghanistan, we ended up getting as many people as, as possible. Uh, but at the same time, I, I wanted to share with you, as Sarah mentioned in terms of the global refugee number, we have also a very forgotten, pro pro protracted refugees around the world. I'll give you one example since I'm uh, from that part of the world. Uh, we have refugees since 1968 in refugee camp uh, in, in, in Sudan. Uh, these are Eritrean refugees. Just think about it, 1968. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, Kenya, you have refugees uh, from Somalia since 1991. Uh, if you go to uh, Algeria, we have refugees, uh, Sahrawi refugees since 1975. So, uh, w you know, when you get lucky to come to this country, you know, uh, uh, even though we, we, you know, we choose and pick who comes to this country, uh, the, the situation all over the world, when you have over one million uh, displaced people, uh, the, the need of engaging uh, and, and Sarah uh, has done a great job it was under Obama administration trying to have a global perspective and engaging other countries to help. But when you think about it, over 100 million IDPs, you are talking very much one in 78 people are either refugees or uh, internally displaced people. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, a lot of advocacy work to do, because um, you know, those refugees who have been this very pro protracted situation, refugee camps, are still languishing in a very difficult place. Uh, that's why you see a lot of migration uh, to Europe, uh, through Libya, through other... Uh, so I think you know, that we, uh, the civil society, uh, nonprofit organization, have a responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless of those people that are not in the media. And I understand you know, the, the value of our, uh, our administration decision to bring Afghan in Ukraine. I understand the, the foreign policy perspective, uh, but there is a lot of humanitarian concern for millions of refugees, whether Rohingyas, uh, whether uh, the Burmese uh, or, or the Syrian refugees at one time, you remember, it was actually about five million of them. Uh, uh, and, then, and then in addition to that, um, sometimes we think, uh, we are, I think as, as, a country, as a country, we did a great job of bringing since 1980 about 3.4 million refugees and successfully resettled them. Uh, but as, as, as a civil society, we have also a responsibility to make sure that all refugees are considered all of them need a uh, durable solution, not necessarily resettlement in this country, but we have, we have a lot of work to do. When you have over 100 million people and 86% of all refugees are hosted by underdeveloped country, means poor country. Uh, you know, Dadaab has over half a million refugees. It's in Kenya. Kenya is not, you know, a very successful country. I mean, successful in a way. They have been welcoming refugees for a long period of time. 
Uh, so I think as we go forward, and I think part of the, uh, the, the responsibility uh, that we have collectively, all of us as citizens, we have to start seeing ourselves to the people uh, that they're suffering. You know, I think that's what the, the connection is. And I think um, LDS has been very generous in helping us the, with the refugee program, but I think collectively, as a country, as a people with a history of migration than any other country, um, that burden is for all of us. It's not a burden. I mean, so her ser serving refugees or helping refugees or speaking for other vulnerable people is really uh, a reflection of our collective value of, of, of caring for another human being. So it, it, the global nature of this migration is going to continue. Uh, one board, uh, board member of the uh, the global uh, community here was talking to me. We'll have also uh, uh, um, uh, climate refugees is also something we'll be confronting in, in soon. Uh, so I think but as, as a country, as, as a community, I think we have done a great job. Um, I think leadership matter and Sarah and her department did incredible job. We had never done it. And I've been doing refugee resettlement since 1980 uh, at the local level. Um, and I had never seen the, the, the leadership taking uh, you know, this incredible decision and organization to bring in the whole go government approach and then the whole country approach. So I think when we do things collectively, we become very, very effective. Uh, and I think that's really what the lesson we learned, but I think that we have a lot of work to do if, if we wanted to be uh, a voice for the people who really needed, uh, not necessarily resettlement, but a, a dignified life. Uh, like any other human being. Thank you. Sarah, you would add anything? Yes, thanks. I, I want to just speak really quickly to your question about the change in, in administrations. And I just, maybe we'll take a minute to look backward and then look forward. And just to say, looking backward at um, the, the first day in our administration with regard to refugee resettlement, we knew right out of the gate that we had an enormous challenge because the system, the entire global infrastructure for refugee resettlement had been decimated over the last several years um, as a function of decreasing um, refugee arrivals and commensurate decreased funding for refugee resettlement. And so as some of you may know, many of our resettlement partners across the country had to um, lay off staff and in some cases close offices. We had over 100 offices across the country close over the four years preceding 2021. Um, which, which made us very aware of a challenge that we knew immediately would be to rebuild and, and restore and strengthen the whole infrastructure. Uh, but we also knew that alongside that, we were going to have to stretch it even farther and get it to a, a whole new place and to, to really try to build it in a more sustainable way. Um, then, as Iskinder was saying, there we were in the summer of 21 and 2021, and with the fall of Kabul, embarked upon what became the largest uh, refugee resettlement effort in modern U.S. history. And it required all of us to scale up immediately and to, to, to try to tap into every single resource we had in the country. I think it's an enormous credit to all of our resettlement partners across the country and all the organizations and the actors that stood up in really extraordinary ways. It really blew us away to see just how much compassion and interest and support there was across the country, particularly for, for Afghans in that moment, veterans groups, diaspora groups, colleges and universities, all sorts of actors who had not traditionally been part of the resettlement landscape, stepped up, they raised their hands, they all wanted to participate. And, and actually one of our challenges was figuring out how to enable them to participate in the system. And it gave us a lot to think about and looking forward, thinking about the, the, the system as a whole and how to plug in. So, Keep in mind also that when, this, when, when we embarked upon this, it was also not only on the heels of this decimated system, but against the backdrop of a global pandemic and against the backdrop of a national shortage of affordable housing and a staffing shortage. So what, what this country did collectively to enable 83,000 Afghans to safely resettle here is really extraordinary. I want to say, though, that looking forward, as we think about new administrations, because we know that, that the Biden administration will not be here forever, 
that while we're thinking about um, capacity and how to build it and ensure that this program is on the, po the, the, the strongest, most durable, resilient footing possible for the future, we also know that it's not just about the capacity, it's about public support for the program. And we deeply believe that engaging more Americans in this work will help expose Americans to why we have a refugee resettlement program, who refugees are, why they need protection, and it will give Americans a stake in this program and show them why it's important to continue to support it. And with that, we hope that going forward, um, there will be a durable base of support to enable this program to enjoy a long future. So um, just to say that we, we are, we're working towards that future and I'll be talking more about um, how we're thinking about it in, in a little bit, but wanted to just comment on that part. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I want you to also take a few minutes uh, to talk about the, this really great efforts that have been made at national level on when it comes to integrating refugees, because as we all know, integration is two ways. Uh, the, the refugees themselves, they need to integrate into the local community, and also the local host community, they also have to make sure that you know, they, they learn and uh, make sure they, they do help the refugees uh, throughout uh, their tradition uh, integration. What are the, some of the national effort has been done to help uh, the integrating refugees and also, you know, what are the, some of the, you know, uh, ways that the local community can help promote welcoming and, and also inclusive society? And then finally, what are the, some of the barriers the refugees uh, face in the United States, especially as they're starting a new life in their education, employment, and so forth? Sarah? <laughs> Oops. Can you hear me? So. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have a clear understanding. Uh, integration, when we say in integration, we are not saying assimilation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, integration is a completely different process. We, we kind of have an organized integration system, uh, but since 1980, uh, I believe at that time, the Carter administration created an office called the Office of Refugee Resettlement. It never existed before because, as you know, prior to 1980, uh, maybe 1978, 1975, we had a very small government program. But prior to that, uh, the refugee program was done completely differently. I think maybe in 1956, we managed to bring in 32,000 Hungarian during the, the Russian invasion. So, so the, this office, uh, which called Office of Refugee Resettlement, and uh, I didn't mention that I used to work there, is part of the job is integration. So integration means, uh, you know, how do we newcomers, we help them employment within a short possible time. Uh, to, to do that, there is a, a nationwide, except the state of Wyoming, we, we have a program of employment um, and, and that employment can be uh, federally funded. Um, but when you look at around the country, our integration system in this country compared to other countries which I have been uh, visiting, um, and we have incredible success. And, you know, again, the reason it's part of what I'll be talking, uh, uh, integration should be based on rights. Uh, so from my perspective, one of the beautiful things we do in this country, welcoming refugees, is we actually enshrine the same kind of rights like uh, other Americans will have except voting. So it means that they have the right to work, they have the right to go to school, they have the right to own property, they have the right you know, to uh, own a business, uh, they have the right to move anywhere. So I usually uh, talk to my Somali friends, if you go to Minneapolis, there are about 300,000 Somalis. And I can assure you that they didn't go there because of the weather. So the same thing here. But so in, in the integration, as a right-based integration, I think we are doing a great job uh, to, to the point that we have a lot of refugees actually holding public office, you know, uh, from Congress, from other uh, city council and county. But I think collectively, uh, since refugee resettlement in this country is not really run by the government, it, you know, as Sarah mentioned, you know, it's run by local community organization. Some of them have a national 
uh, connection. So we do refugee resettlement at local level. The Kawada clubs, the church, the chamber of commerce, uh, the local police, all of them play a role in terms of integrating refugees based on the right base, as I said before. So to continue to that, I think we need to engage more civil, civil society organization, churches, mosques, you know, a synagogue, uh, that's really the key. Because as I said, we don't have a government-run integration model. Um, as some of you know, integration discussion has been going back to maybe 1920s in this country with other refugees or migrants coming in from Europe and other places. But the, 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 the most important integration process we have is at the local level, uh, you know, voting uh, and participating in election um, and, and being a part of the community through uh, churches, through synagogues, through a mosque, uh, and working and being part of the, the economy grows. I think we'll be talking in terms of the contribution of refugees, in terms of opening a business. Uh, yesterday, the taxi driver brought me from uh, from the airport. He was telling me that there is even restaurant in a remote area uh, that opened by refugees uh, who came in from from Africa. Uh, so, if you if you look at look back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, before the Vietnamese refugee program, and and now in terms of the business ownership, in terms of people graduating from school and becoming part of the workforce you will see that that kind of right base, based on equality uh, uh, and inclusiveness policy that we have at, at local level and is really working very well. But at the national level, I think we have, you know, even though we don't call it integration office, it, the, the entire Office of Refugee Resettlement, where I used to work, is focuses on ASL classes, with school impact classes, older uh, refugee services, all of them is based on the idea of integration and empowering uh, without uh, insisting that they have to assimilate or they have to abandon their own language, their own religion, their own beliefs. So that's the way I see it. So. Oh. Um, so I'm really grateful that Iskander started because actually the way our system works is that the State Department is responsible for the first 90 days of, of the initial reception and placement period for refugees, after which ORR is really the, the main US uh, federal agency that helps facilitate longer term integration. So from where I sit, our main challenge is to, to think about the system and how we create a, a resettlement program that unleashes all of that power that, that civil society and local resettlement actors across the country are able to tap into to, to engage their own communities and help with resettlement. As I said just a few minutes ago, one of the things that I have found so uplifting and so heartening over the last few years is just the ways in which communities have stepped up to welcome and help integrate refugees. And in particular, I've been really excited to see some of the partnerships that have come up with colleges and universities who, especially during Operation Allies Welcome, really um, came to the table to offer all of the vast resources that universities can bring. For example, um, on-campus housing, connection to educational opportunities, and employment opportunities in some cases, and a college community that can provide a warm welcome to a refugee family. And so it's really given us a lot to think about as we look toward a future resettlement system that wants to do just that. It's to devolve all this, this, um, this power to welcome into the communities and enable them to provide um, the, what is needed to, to most um, successfully help put refugees on a path to self-sufficiency and, and really successful integration for the longer term. So um, that's how we think about it at the, the sort of, you know, 1,000, 500,000 foot level, but it's, um, it's really the work of ORR and the partners around the country who, who do the work at, uh, day in and day out. I was just going to say that I think um, in addition to the wonderful co these contributions that, um, you know, one of the major roles of integration is on on the individual, um, on the U.S. Um, citizen, uh, whether born or naturalized, to welcome. And um, I think that we have a country um, who, w who wants to do that at the heart of our country. Um, many of our own families, um, the Native nations, of course, 
this was their land before many of our families came, but many of our family stories are connected through migration, um, whether that's one, two, three, four, or five generations back, potentially 10 generations for the Maxfields. We just had a conversation about this. Um, but either way, we were welcomed at some point, and I think our country is still at our hearts want to be the welcomer. And so um, that is the lane that I'm very interested in right now is how do we bring that back to the forefront? And I think all of us that are involved in these various pieces of work are very important on the actual processing of folks um, who need need welcome and so thank you. I applaud each of you in all the ways that you touch that work. Uh, but also we have this constant need to continue to encourage the welcomer, highlight the welcomer, allow folks to see themselves in the message of welcome, in the vision of being a welcomer. I think it's very important and I think that's what will get us through these very kind of sticky moments that we're having in our, in our national dialogue. So that's what I would add. Um, on our final question, as we know, refugees and immigrants uh, are critical to, the, you know, to our Amer American economic success. Refugees and immigrants uh, fill a lot of the jobs that are available in our communities, but they do face economic integration challenges, such as the refugees that are skilled and immigrants, when they come, it's really hard for them to get the job of their career. Like when I arrived in, in Utah, you know, I already had a law degree and, you know, but I was not able to get that professional job that I was planning to get. So I had to start from somewhere. So uh, the question is, you know, what are the, some of the programs that can help the refu uh, bridge the refugee skills? How can we support business owners to welcome uh, newcomers and prepare employers for a globalized workforce? Can I go first, and then please, a skinder? Please, please. I know you have lots of good stuff to say. Yeah. Um, well, this, this is my potential geek out zone, so I'll save it for my part of the presentation later. Um, but, you know, we have so much to gain by welcoming newcomers. Um, uh, any economists in the room? Anybody willing to call yourself an economist? I know we don't want to out ourselves. I will. Um, so, um, you know, we are in dire need of labor, in dire need of labor, right? Um, we are right now, if we legally authorize 37% more workers this moment, we only stop sort of the bleeding of the boomer retirement loss from the job market, right? So in terms of legal workers, if we had 37% more worker population, we just break even, right? And that allows us not, that's not even global, globally competitive types of margins, right? So we need workers. Um, we know we have skilled, um, all types of skills, skilled talent to be welcomed, right? Whether that person works in agriculture or works in technology, that's a skilled worker, and we need all of those folks. So. I would just say, um, uh, in addition to my, my conversation earlier about the welcomer and bringing the conversation in that space, I would also urge folks to really bring the conversation to refugees, and I would say, and immigrants, help to um, ensure that we can meet our labor challenges and our inflation issues, right? Our Thanksgiving meal was 20% more expensive this last year um, than the year before, just because we didn't have the agricultural workers to be able to meet the needs and the supply chain, the transportation workers, to get the foods to the stores, and so prices were higher. Um, so we need these um, incredibly skilled folks at all parts of our, all of our industries and all parts of those, of the supply chain. Um, there are a couple really incredible programs. Upwardly Global, for example, is a program. I just worked there until October, um, and they, um, they are a great combination with the Refugee Resettlement Program, where we look to immediately get someone a sustaining job a group like Upperly Global then comes along a couple years later and works to get them back into their professional position or industry, right? Um, so there's some programs out there that are wonderful. There's lots of um, workforce development intersecting programs um, with the immigrant community that I would recommend. But it's a huge need, uh, and we um, need to have more workers, and we have these folks. The other thing I would say in the messaging lane on that, and then I'll turn this to Iskinder, is that um, often we talk about refugee um, refugees as being needy, 
And that's so untrue, right? Yes, there is a, a, you know, a 12 month potentially, some faster to be honest, but a, a 12 month on ramp to say, hey, this is your new country, this is the new system, this is what it's like. But once folks get through that phase, they are often some of the most incredible contributors to our society and our economy. And so also that's a very important, um, you know, kind of part of the economic message when it, when it comes to uh, refugees. Great, thank you. So I just wanna make sure we know when we're talking about refugees, Refugees come to this country not because of their uh, background in terms of education and business, well, even though some of them are doctors. We have a, a program in this country, it's called uh, H-Visa, where a lot of skilled workers come to this country. Our refugee program, we have to always maintain this idea, is a humanitarian program. Whether you have education or not, but certain criteria, we believe that they should be resettled here. Having said that, I believe that refugees and immigrants are being an economic engine for this country. 75% of all startup IT started either by a refugee or an immigrant. This is a data from Silicon Valley. Uh, if you are wondering, we don't know any, some of them, the founder of Google was, was a refugee. Uh, and if you look at the number of immigrants and refugees, CEOs and major Fortune 500 companies are uh, either immigrants or, uh, they, or second generation uh, of refugees. So, so refugees and immigrants in this country has been uh, always an engine to this country. Uh, my, my feeling is, you know, I always believe in, you know, this country is built by and ordinary people who came to this country became extraordinary. Uh, refugees and immigrants, you know, and, and of course African Americans as we build this country. So, you know, sometimes people think refugees are a burden. I, I don't believe any human being can be a burden to another human being, but we have data to show that our economy in every sector, from housing, from, from everywhere you see in terms of uh, IT, uh, there is a small town in Georgia, uh, it's called Clarkston, Georgia, if you know. Uh, and I was there 40 years ago, uh, probably the first refugee in Clarkston, Georgia. I don't know why they chose close to Stone Mountain to resettle me there, but I, uh, so when I, went, <laughs> when I went back, out of 130 uh, businesses, 129 in Clarkston, Georgia is owned by refugees. So if you go around the country, from Minnesota, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Lewiston, Maine, uh, you will see refugee businesses thriving. Yes, we have some challenges. We don't know how to take advantage of people with credentials from other countries, doctors, engineers. We have never really done a good job of recertification. And I poor dream of, uh, uh, the organization she's talking with may be helpful, but that's something we struggle. We have a lot of doctors who came to this country and ended up being taxi driver and now becoming Uber driver. We haven't done as a, as a country and, and the administration, uh, you know, not this administration, all of us previously, we haven't done in terms of how can we recert, recertify them. You know, Canada came up with a good uh, policy, especially Quebec, they have this bi bilateral relationship with France. If you are a medical doctor in France, you can actually practice also in, in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in Quebec uh, without having to go through a license. So that's, that's a weakness of our, because there's a lot of good people with experience and expertise in so many fields. We haven't taken advantage, they just have to, like any other refugees, like uh, Eden mentioned, first you have to take a, a job um, in, and then do it yourself. When I came to the US, um, you know, my, I was telling Eden this morning, I was making uh, $3.35 an hour, even though that was working for IRC uh, pro before coming to, to the US. So that, that's really how the system has been developed, but I think we have a lot of work. I think I'm glad to hear that uh, Utah is, is now allowing uh, refugees and immigrants, including undocumented, to go to college. That's, a, that's the best way to take advantage of some, some of this recertification. Thank you.
Um, we have a couple minutes left uh, for our panel. So if any, we might take a couple questions. Uh, so if the audience, uh, anybody has any question, I know that our panelists each will be doing a briefing later on, that they will be diving into uh, some of the things that they mentioned in their presentation, but if a couple more questions, we'll be happy to take it. A gentleman uh, in the middle. Thank you. I'm interested in so sort of looking in your opinions, looking at the future of more climate refugees on a sort of order of magnitude, what we have currently, uh, what sort of systems uh, might be needed to respond to a sort of massive uh, increase in the number of refugees in the future? And perhaps particularly, how would we sell the benefit of refugees to uh, countries that might receive them? Sure, so thank you for that question. I should say just from, just to be super technical about it, we, um, we currently don't use the term climate refugees because there's a very specific um, definition of a refugee as someone who flees, a, uh, flees their country as a result of persecution on, on five articulated grounds that I won't go into now, but, but, but the spirit of your question about what are we, how are we thinking about climate change um, is, is exactly the right kind of question that we are um, to be asking ourselves because as we um, look across the, the you know, future global trends, obviously climate change is a major driver of migration and it intersects with um, with protection needs in really important ways. So often in reality, when people are fleeing their countries, there's lots of reasons why they're doing it. Climate change might be one, contri one contributing reason, but there might be others, especially in, in this hemisphere. A lot of the migration that we see um, in, in the um, central, central and South America are sort of a combination of these things. And so we're trying to think holistically about systems and how we need to manage these flows. Um, and we, within the, the US government, also work really closely as, through our migration programs with, um, with other governments to help them manage migration flows, recognizing that migration, our, our approach to it is that it's not something to be stopped, but it's a global phenomenon that we just have to learn to manage and create the systems to help facilitate in a way that benefits um, receiving countries, the migrants themselves, and, and all the countries that are part of that experience from, from destination through transit to de um, from origin to trans through transit to um, destination. So it is something that we are thinking about um, all the time within the US government, though all, we, we are a little bit, I would say, behind on that thinking because we, um, we, hadn't, we hadn't been organized and, and seized with it in, in, a, in a really significant way until the past few years. So I could bore you, bore you with lots of conversations about task forces and working groups that have been stood up. But what I'll just say from my perspective, um, from where I sit on the resettlement side, is we are in really um, engaged conversations, in particular with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and other global partners, to think about how to take better account of climate factors in doing a refugee assessment. And in particular, to, be, to recognize the fact that some refugee populations are are themselves at greater risk because of where they're located. So if they're in um, disaster prone areas, there are lots of refugees who, you know, unsurprisingly, refugee camps are often not in the prime real estate within a, within a country. And so refugees who have already been displaced and dispossessed of, of so much in their lives are now at risk again due to climate change. And so we're looking at ways that we can um, work through those considerations of who's even more vulnerable as a result of climate change and factor that into our determinations around who, who is in, most in need of resettlement. So, um, so that's the resettlement piece. I think, I think you'll see a lot more um, movement uh, around um, global policy making with regard to climate change and migration in the, in the coming years though. Thank you. We might take one more question and then we will go on a break. You want a mic or? Um, I have a question. When you talk about the pendulum swing between administrations, that's obviously a major challenge. But then you talk about um, 
kind of this new area of focus where American citizens can sponsor families. Would that number still fall within the number that the administration, different administrations set for refugees? Or is there something that could be done where if that pendulum swing is capped with those that are going through the pipeline of refugee resettlement, if those that are coming through sponsorship, if that's different? Just, I don't know, I would love you to maybe expand on that or how we can work through the pendulum swing. Does this work? Okay. That's a great question. It's, it's something that we have been thinking a lot about because we're, we're rather constrained with regard to setting uh, an overall um, ceiling for refugee admissions. Every year, the president set, has a presidential determination that sets the overall ceiling. And we looked really hard at this question of whether we could um, create a separate pathway for sponsorship. And the answer, it turns out, was no. But so we've now built it into the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program and our intention for the, for the way that it will be factored in, and I will speak at much greater length about this very soon, but, um, but our intention is that, at least for now, uh, we aren't as concerned about numbers and targets because with a ceiling of 125,000 refugees for this year, we have, uh, we're not gonna hit that, and so we have plenty of room within the, the, that determination for this year, but we are thinking very carefully about how we build it into our future planning, and the, the intention is to raise the presidential target commensurate with the growth of sponsorship alongside the traditional resettlement that will always be sort of the backbone of, of our refugee protection efforts here. Um, it's, it is, I would say that the, when we think about the pendulum swinging, it's part of the reason why we are being so intentional about the sponsorship component of US RAP. Um, that is where we see the most potential to really um, expose Americans to this work, get them engaged, and, and give them um, an understanding of the importance of it and a place to advocate for greater refugee resettlement. So it will all come through the US Refugee Admissions Program, at least as far as I can tell for the foreseeable future, but it will be, I think, it will, it will look and feel different and it will give Americans an experience that will enable them to hopefully in the future be advocates for the program. Uh, so this will conclude our session. I want to thank our panel uh, for their expertise and then uh, their time. So uh, we will be back at 2.15, 2, uh, we'll take 10 minutes break. And then each of the panel will take a few minutes uh, to, to, to give us some more briefing. Uh, so thank you.